there we go. Hey guys and welcome to another episode of Digital Classroom. The first thing I we always ask in the chat is the audio okay. We are switching between systems constantly, so sometimes the audio is set up for another system and well, we just ask how is the audio, so probably okay. Okay, let's start our Digital Classroom for today. And today is absolutely an awesome one because today it's about everything you always wanted to know the time is right three so let me just PM. click here and let's start our digital classroom Okay, so that's always the biggest worry. Does the audio sound right? Hey, over the years, we've done so much with Digital Classroom. We've done live shoots, we've done interviews, we've done location shoot even once. And we are planning on doing so much more. But sometimes people also ask me like, hey Frank, what's your opinion on this? What is your opinion on that? And on social media, you already know if you email me or if you put a post on social media, you will always get a reply. I try to answer literally just everybody. But we thought that it would also be nice to have some reference for people to go back to. Like, hey, the most asked questions, they are here. So that's why a few days ago I started asking you guys, send me in questions that you want answered. So if you are on YouTube, there is a chat open. You can literally go into the chat and ask any questions. We don't have stuff like super chat that costs you money. It's all for free. That's thanks to BenQ and Rogue, we can do this for free. So we don't charge you any money for questions. I think that's not my thing. Now on Facebook, because I'm doing it alone today, and week is here, but she's not constantly monitoring. So please, if you don't get an answer to your question, don't feel bad. Use the YouTube chat. That way you will get an answer. Or maybe if we see it on Facebook, I will answer it there. Okay, so let's start with the questions. And of course, the first question, and that's the one we always get, and I didn't want to do it in the live broadcast, but I thought, you know what? What is your favorite lens? What is my favorite lens? Yeah, well, that's actually pretty hard to answer because I strongly believe there is no favorite lens for the very simple reason. All lenses tell a different story. And this is why I did include it in here because I think a lot of people don't realize this, that part of your storytelling is also how your image looks, how your image breathes, how your image is composed, but also how it looks for three dimensionality. Now you might wonder three dimensionality, Frank, what do you mean? I want you to do the following thing. Now, most people that do fashion photography or portraits will have 70 to 200 on their camera. Now, do me one favor. Take a picture on 200 mil of a bottle of Coke or whatever. Do the same thing on 70. Compare the two and you will see that there's a slight difference in three dimensionality. The 70 mil will be a little bit more rounder and we call this compression. So this is also why you throw the backdrop out of focus, right? Because you compress and the more distance there is between your model and the backdrop, the more it will be out of focus, the longer the lens. Compression. But compression also means that it flattens an image, so it can flatten the face of somebody. Now, many, many years ago, I also told people oh, the best lens you can get, 70 to 200, that's the best portrait lens ever. And it was almost glued on my camera until it broke down. And then I was forced to use the 2470 for quite a long time. And I absolutely fell in love with it. And the lens is now on my camera almost constantly. And I'm not going to say it's the best lens, but it's my favorite lens. And for very simple reasons, on 70 mil, I still have that compression. So I can still whack the background out of focus. But on 24, I have that nice distortion in my image. I have that nice, well, how, do, how can you call it? It's, it's nice. It just flows. So uh, let me see if I have an image here. So I have my iPad set up, of course. And let me just go to my portfolio very quickly. And I'm going to switch over so you guys can see what I'm doing. Otherwise, I'm just talking to the camera. There we go. Okay, so let's see what I mean with the 24 mil. Okay, simple, qu simple here. Here you already see it. It has way more depth. It just goes straight in. So you are more, how do you say it? You are more engaged with the image. Let me turn the audio just a little bit down. There we go. I think that's better. So the 24 mil gives you a little bit more distortion and it just leads you nicer towards the model. 
And I do it in a lot of shots actually, and sometimes also without knowing it. So when I go to galleries, let's go to portfolio. Let's just go for every fashion shot. This is wider angle, low angle. So a wider angle from a lower angle up. So you literally also use that distortion and that compression for making your model look taller or bigger. You can make legs look a lot longer. And you know what, if you look at the images, you don't say, oh, that's a wide angle shot, but it is. And that's because I use it for leading lines. So I still have my model somewhere where it doesn't distort, but the feet and the, the legs are just moving you up. So I try to comp compose it so that you don't see a lot of the distortion, but it's still there. And on 24, there's not a lot of distortion, but you know what I mean, right? And of course, when you do it over the top, you get stuff like this. And this is actually what I really love about those wide angles. Uh, let me go. So you get those hero poses. But also in tight spaces. See. I've done so many shots with wide angles. Almost everything that comes by is literally slightly wide angled. There you go. So tight space all the way down on the floor. Just aim the camera up. You see your image. You see the lights in there. It just gives you a very mesmerizing image, I think. Okay, so let me switch back to full screen. Okay, question. Um, how do you encourage a beginner to have confidence in himself when he has self-doubt? Robert, we all have self-doubt. I doubt myself literally every single day. To give you a, a fine example of this. So, here we have a guitar, right? We all know a guitar, six string, right? Okay. Now, listen to this. When I'm alone, totally alone, I play pretty good guitar. Now, as soon as somebody's watching or I, I would do a live stream or whatever, it doesn't look right anymore. I'm, I'm terrified. I can't do it anymore. And this is something that you will also see with photography and with posing. The fun thing is, when can you perform again? In a very relaxed environment. So if people are relax to you, nice. Hey, how are you doing today? Okay, we're gonna have a great shoot today. It's gonna be awesome. And as soon as they're in front of the camera, you go like, yeah, I love that shot. Come on, do it. Yeah, this is, this is amazing. And you will find out very quickly that people will absolutely start relaxing in front of your camera. It's amazing when you see it happen. Now, I'm always very, very in doubt about myself. Every image I see coming in, I doubt myself like, is this really a good image? Nah, it actually sucks. It doesn't look right. And well, okay, maybe after retouching and then after retouching. Like, so we're always doubting. And then you put it online and you see people going, wow, I love it. So you go like, okay, maybe it's good. I think the best thing is to be in doubt. Because that means that you're always pushing yourself. I know that a lot of musicians, but also photographers, and in any branch you have them, the cocky guys, the ones, ah, I know everything. You see them on YouTube and they go like, they just breathe that arrogance from I know everything. You can't tell me anything. Those guys, trust me, they will stay in one level and they will probably never level up. Now the really open guys, look, look at, for example, on guitar players, look at the Steve Vai or a Brian May. They are always sharing their stuff, but they also improve every single time. And they get a big following that also helps them improve. So if you are in doubt, everybody is in doubt, just relax, take a few steps back and just make it a party. Literally make it a party, but still serious of course, but relax and have fun with it. Okay, another question. Um, I have a question after updating my iMac from Mahovi to Catalina Lightroom camera roll bridge won't update anymore. Any tips? <sighs> no. In all honesty, I'm switching back to Mac myself on Tuesday. Yes, I'm going to tell you that in a moment. And I, the, the only thing I know is when you do an OS update, it's always wise to just wait a little bit. I don't, unless on a production machine, of course, I wait. But when you do an OS update, sometimes it's best to just delete the whole stuff from Adobe and just install it again. And with the cloud nowadays, it's really easy to reinstall. So I think over the years, I've reinstalled Lightroom two or three, three times and it just works great. Okay, favorite modifier. <laughs> modifier, yes, now we're getting there. Strobes, right? Okay, so strobes, favorite modifier. This varies per person, but also per style. I like to have really focused lights. Now, can you imagine me focused lights, right? Yes. So when you look at all the portraits, let me just show you some of you to make it a little bit more interesting for you guys. 
also if you don't know my work. So let's go, for example, in portraits. So I love modifiers that literally just give you that edge, that give you that really nice, like, ka to your image, that, that bell sound almost in a guitar, or that beautiful hammer-like sound on a piano. And I think in, in strokes and in lighting, you have exactly the same thing. You have lighting that gives you that little bit of an edge, that sparkle. And beauty dishes with, um, with silver inlays, they really do that. They really make you spark. But it wouldn't be my choice for favorite modifier. So I think, let me just see if I have images that were shot just with that modifier. I think if I'm correct, this comes very close. So what I love is absolutely the strip light and the strip light with a grid. Now the strip light is this. So it's not square, it's literally like a rectangle. English is not my native language. So, and by using it that way, you literally have something that can light the whole body from top to bottom, but it's still very, very tight in the width. So that means that you can literally just aim it towards the model and cut out the light that falls somewhere else. Now, when you have a big softbox and you want your model in the hotspot, so this is the softbox. This is the hotspot. See all that light that is spilling around? Now do the same, time, same thing with the strip light. I have this. Yeah? And what I did in this image probably, I don't remember if it was a strip light, was actually use it not this way, but move it like this. And now you have a little like a bar of light. Now we're going to do the um, photo days next week, this weekend actually. And what we're going to do there is actually we're going to bring a strip light and a beauty dish with a grid. That's it. With those two, I can literally do almost everything that I want to do. So, yeah, that is absolutely amazing. The strip light with the grid, if I could choose only one modifier, that would be it without any doubt. So, favorite lens, favorite modifier. Now let's continue. Why the iPad? Yeah, I remember that one. Um, before COVID broke out, I I had a system in the studio set up with a 24-inch XP Pen tablet to draw. I had all the other stuff set up there. Then COVID broke out and it meant that we worked a lot more from home. So I've set up everything here at home where I'm sitting now. But still, you have a laptop and when the summer came, I was kind of like, I would love to work outside. And I have this iPad, right? So why not use it? Now, before that, I never really took a serious look at Lightroom on the iPad. You know, it's for consumers. It's for my mom and my dad. It's nice. Maybe for any week, for, but not for the professionals like us, right? Oh, I was wrong. Lightroom on the iPad has made so much progress over the last few years that it's insane what you can do now. I can do the full skin retouching on the iPad. I literally teach a whole class on using the iPad in a professional workflow. So not, okay, you can also use the iPad. No, you can use the iPad. And I think that's a big difference between a few years ago as I looked at the iPad was I can use it. And now is it I use it. So it's not a can anymore. It's like, it's not a backup. It's my main device to work on. And it also spurred the other one. That's why I set the two questions together. So why the iPad? Very simple. When traveling, when sitting in a tight spot or on the couch, I can always work. I have the Apple Pencil with it. So you can literally draw on the screen. It's not like XP Pen or Wacom, but it's, it's close. The experience is really, really nice. And we have battery life forever. Plus, and this is the big plus, when I look at my Dell, it's a great laptop. I have an XPS i9. It's a great laptop. However, the big problem with the Dell is that when I go outside, first of all, the battery dies really fast when you have it without any power. There's also the problem that when I don't have power, I'm reset back to my internal video card, the onboard video card, which is okay, but it's not really great. Plus, I don't have a bright display. The iPad solves everything. So I was planning when the workshop starts again, I will take my iPad out. I have 1000 nits brightness and I can also retouch the images. And then Apple did something really weird. A few years ago, I said I'm leaving Apple for the very simple reason. They took everything away that I loved. I love the MagSafe. Save my laptop like a gazillion times. Why the heck do you take out an SD card reader? Why the heck do you take out HDMI? And why does it all have to be thinner and nicer looking? I'm not a fashion model. I'm a photographer. I'm a creator. I want a beast and I don't want a fashion device. If I want a fashion device, I will buy something else. 
I want a beast of a machine. And the MacBook Pro was always the beast of a machine. Now, last uh, Unleashed project, I believe it was uh, the, the live stream, they released the new MacBook Pros and everything came back. And I told you guys a few years ago, if Apple brings everything back, I'm switching back from Windows to Mac. Not because I don't like Windows, but the integration. So the next question was from somebody, why did you buy the new MacBook while you are raving about Windows? Very simple. Mac OS and Windows, if you know what you're doing, if you know what you're doing, are both great operating systems. There's no problem with Windows, there's no problem with Mac OS. If there's a problem, I still think that Windows is a little bit easier to fix than Mac OS. But if you run into a real problem, Mac OS is probably the better bet because you won't run into those real problems that you can't fix. Now I'm a pretty tech-savvy guy with computers, so for me Windows and Mac OS are almost the same. I can switch between them and I know I'm pretty much in depth. If you don't know a lot about computers, a Mac is a very, very good choice. Now, why did I go back? Connectivity. I already use that iPad almost all the time, the M1 iPad. I love the display. Outside, the display is just gorgeous. It's 1000 nits, peak brightness, I believe 1600 nits. Remember those settings or those numbers. And it just looks amazing outside and it runs all day on a battery. So great to teaching workshops. But I also miss the full version of Lightroom and Photoshop when I'm teaching workshops. I don't need them, but sometimes a client or students ask, hey, can you do something which I can't do on the iPad? There are still some things that you can't do. So I would love a full operating system, but I also love that touch. Now, Apple has something called a side card. And it means that if you hold your iPad close to your computer, it will switch over as a second device and you can literally just use your pen on it. This combined with all the ports that came back and the most important thing, the display, 1000 nits outside, 1600 nits peak brightness. Remember those settings? iPad? Yes. So now I can finally teach my workshops outside with a laptop that runs all day, has peak brightness, has more than enough for people to see my images and they don't have to go like, even in a tent, sometimes it was too bright. So those are the things that I find really interesting now with Apple, plus that combination of the iPad Pro to your computer so you can retouch on a surface without using cables. There's nobody in the world at this moment that has such a nice structure. Now, there was also a question and I will answer that right away. I had it a little bit lower on the list, but now that, that I tell my story, I can actually do it better here. Which smartphone do you advise? I still don't advise iPhones for the cameras. I think iPhones are great. Any week has an iPhone, my son has an iPhone, and they, they make great images and video is absolutely awesome on it for a consumer. I think for a professional photographer like me, like you, I think the Sony um, smartphones, I have one here, the Xperia, and Huawei, actually, and maybe also Samsung. I don't have any experience with Samsung, but Huawei and Sony, for me, create beautiful, beautiful cameras that can also make phone calls. And I think that's the difference. The iPhone is still a smartphone with a really cool camera, with a really good camera. Don't get me wrong, I'm not bitching the, the iPhone at all. But it's not a camera that you can make calls with. This phone is really a camera that you can make, phones, uh, that you can make phone calls with. How do I know? Very simple. When I press here, it automatically starts up my camera in raw mode. So it's off, I pick it up, I press the button and I immediately have my camera interface. And the interface is literally, let me show you very quickly, exactly the same as on my normal professional camera. So I have exposure compensation, I can do manual, I can do out of focus, manual focus and all the other stuff. So yeah, for smartphones, in all honesty, I'm a Sony ambassador. Yes, of course. So. Take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. Sorry, I have to get my list back. Sony, Xperia, highly, highly underrated smartphones, which are actually cameras. Okay, so we have some more questions here. Hey Frank, did you ever have an inspiration block? Wait, how you handle it? Um, Bert, no, never. And I I'm honest, never. I think what I do have sometimes is motivation block. So I always have ideas, but sometimes the motivation is not there. And this is a slight difference for me. I never had a problem with finding something to do. Even with music, I just start up a drum computer and even if I use the same beat, I will always come up with something new. 
I don't know why, but it just happens and I'm not going to lie about it. It's, it's very, very cool to do. However, with photography, it is sometimes also that motivation and I found it out with COVID. So you are now normally you're in a rush and you always go like, oh, I wish I had a day off. I, I wish I had a week off. Oh my, I would love a month off. Maybe a sabbatical. Oh, may that would be awesome. And then immediately you are confronted with a year and a half of doing absolutely nothing. No workshops, hardly any photo shoots. And that's when it hit me, the motivation block. I could have done, and I actually did, a lot of, for example, product photography about all my action figures or my guitars, the pedals and what not more. But the first few months or a few weeks, actually, I literally only just sat down on the couch and watched Netflix. Well, before the pandemic, if you would have asked me, what would you do? I'd, oh, I would love it. I would go back. I would read all my comics. I would watch all the movies I ever wanted. I would go out, go mountain biking. I would pick up my guitar, write new songs and all those ideas. And then it happens and you just go. Whoa. And I literally crashed. About a few weeks in, I just recovered myself and was going like, this is not the way. But even now, even today, I still have to kick myself. Okay, Frank, let's do this. You have to do it. Let's do. Now I look back, I wrote um, one new book. I rewritten one book and actually we did a translation of the of uh, the small flash book. I did two instructional videos. <laughs> we did a lot of behind the scenes uh, videos. Uh, we did a lot of product photo shoots. So when I look back and I look at the images I took and the video, it's still not the way that it was before COVID. But it's not something to be ashamed of. And I think that's also something in your mindset. Like, I feel really bad about this whole period. Like, I could have done more. And then you look back and you go like, yeah, like what? Because you already did so much. So I think that's the mindset. And I think that's also where, for example, your creativity block comes from. It's thinking that you are not good enough and thinking that your idea is not good enough. And at that point, you just block and you just stop. Maybe... Just think about, okay, I'm going to do this and just start with it and just build it from there. And then you will find out that your creativity will go left, go right, go straight on, go back, go in a, in a turn. And you will end up with something new constantly. But that motivation, for me, that's the main problem. That's where I struggle with a lot. I really have to push myself to get to work. And then when I'm working or when I'm playing, then everything just flows. So, But creativity, yeah, no problem. But... The thing is also, I, I love movies, I watch a lot of uh, comics, I read a lot of comics, and that combination, there's always something that triggers your, your, your state of mind, something visual, and you want to recreate. So that's how I uh, solved it, I hope. Okay, um, Frank, back to Apple, yay, yay, well, almost. Are there things you have, let me see, are there things you have to now when you look for a location to photograph? Are there any laws you have to... Okay, um, locations we don't do at the moment for the very simple reason uh, we, are, we take this whole pandemic very, very seriously. So I am vaccinated, but I'm not going to do anything for fun at the moment. So we're not going to do any location shoots. We hardly do any TFP shoots at the moment, actually zero. I only do workshops and of course we have to make money, right? But even the workshops, we keep our distance. So we don't go to locations now. Before pandemic, uh, we still have to get licenses to go to a location. It is a little bit easier because we have a really big portfolio with castles, with uh, beautiful locations outside of Europe also, which we can show. We, and it helps if you go to a local, uh, let's say, a church where you want to shoot, and you show them images that you did actually fashion shoots in Dubai. That really helps. It opens up a lot of doors. But overall, you still need a license. It's the law counts for everybody. But what licenses do you need? For public places, believe it or not, you don't need anything as far as I know. The thing that I want to address is get a license, even for a public space, for the very simple reason. We've done a photo shoot on a graveyard many years ago. And trust me, I would never do a shoot on a graveyard out of respect. But this was really the whole concept. It was just great. And we did it with the full most respect. So don't worry. The thing was, I went to our local county and said, hey, do I need a license? Or I want a license to shoot on the graveyard. And they were going like, uh, okay, what are you going to do? Is it commercial? No, no, it's own work. It's portfolio work. Okay, um, no, you don't need a license. I said, well, you know what? Give me a license. I, I still want to pay for it. It's like 12 euros. Just give me one. Okay, your money. So he stamped the license and I'm done. The reason I did it was immediately clear within half an hour. 
We went to the graveyard, we found a place that we didn't disturb any grave, so we shut it from the back, set everything up, but we also used a smoke machine. So, some people saw smoke, right? There were people complaining to us, like, hey, what are you doing here? Now we're doing a photo shoot. Do you know it's a graveyard? Now, if I didn't have a license, the story would go like this. Do you know it's a graveyard? Yes. Okay, you, can't, you are not allowed to shoot here. Yes, I am. No, you're not. We're going to call the police. The police comes over, and in that meantime, you can't do anything. There's stress for your team, there's stress for yourself, and of course, it just doesn't work that way, right? So, what do you do? You get a license. Hey, what are you doing? I'm doing a photo shoot here, the license from the county. Oh, nice. Oh, hey, I like that setting. I like that model. Somebody else comes in. Hey, what are you doing here? Oh, they're doing a photo shoot. It's okay, they have a license. Works so much easier. Best 12 money, 12 euros spent ever. And let me see if I can find the images from that set very quickly. So let's go. I think it's under heroes and villains. They're really old photo shoots. I don't even know if they're still on my portfolio. Very well be that they're already gone. Yeah. Let me see. Yeah, let me try one more thing and otherwise we're just going to continue with the next question because they, they were really nice images. The way back. No. Uh, feel free to go on my portfolio and find them. Maybe I miss them, but I think they are not there anymore. I have way too many images online. Oh, I did find them. Ha! What? Okay, just to give you an idea. And by using that compression, we actually make it look like she's on top of the grave, but it's the back. And this was a monument, so there was nobody there. So, hey, we solved it. It looks genuine, right? I still love that shot. Okay. Um, okay. Let me see. Let me go to the next question. How do you approach your career? Um, career. Okay. I don't. Really. I, I don't. Absolutely zero. Now, what do I mean with this? I think and I strongly believe that if you set goals and you always try to get your goals, you will be disappointed at one time. For the very simple reason, you can't achieve it. Like, I love Brian May. I would love to take a picture of Brian May. If that was my goal, like, okay, I'm happy when I take a picture of Brian May. That will never happen, right? And when my goal is to earn 1,000 euros with photography this week, and I don't succeed in that goal, I get frustrated. Now, what is the worst thing for somebody, and I think this is also a cool answer to that previous question, what is the best creativity killer? Frustration. Because if you don't feel nice, if you are not relaxed, you can't take your pictures, you can't be creative. So, in other words, don't set any goals. Now, I'm not going to say that you don't have to work your ass off. You do. But if you work with passion, if you work with total de de devotion to your profession, and you just love what you do, that will reflect on people. That will reflect in your work and people will start asking you. You know the, the saying, right? It's always good to have a network. Without network, you're nowhere. Well, that's 100% true, also for photography. If you don't have a network, it doesn't work. So, you still have to have that network. And how do you get that network? By working your butt off for years and years, learning to get to know people, learning to use those people, uh, not use those people, but you know what I mean, right? Together with those people, you grow. It's not use, because if you use somebody, that will totally go wrong in the long run. Trust me, don't ever do that. Always be genuine and open. So, I think for the career, I never intended to be a Kelby One instructor. I'm, I'm honored to be one. I'm totally over the moon with it, of course. I never inspired to write a book. I never inspired to teach workshops twice a week or to go to the photo fair or whatever. I always embrace it and I take it. And at that point, I set myself, I set myself little goals. Like, okay, I want to do this, but it's something that's achievable. So for career choice, just do what you do with passion, but don't, and I stress you, don't quit your day job for photography. You have to be very, very lucky to be able to earn enough money to lose your day job for that. Okay, when you have an intake with a model, what are the things you look at? Oh, um, yes. 
I look for something quirky. Now, literally, all the models we use, uh, let, let's just go for fun, let's just go for to some images. And let's go for portraits. Or let's just go here. And these are old images. And I'm not selecting them, I'm just going through them. Look at how Nadine is looking here and here. Look at the styling. This is not one of my models. This is a beautiful model we met in America. This is not one of my models. This is one of my models. See the difference? This is not one of my models. This is. This is. This is not, but she's really good. This is also not one of my models. This isn't, and I wish it was. Also not my models. Not my models. Not. Yes. 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 So what I'm trying to show you guys is what I'm looking for is not just a pretty face, not just somebody that's beautiful and people go like, wow, what a great looking model. I'm looking for some, somebody that's a little bit quirky, a little bit offbeat. They still have to look really nice, of course, for the picture. But I prefer somebody that has a normal figure, so not a size zero, also maybe not totally round, of course, but not a size zero, normal figure, but most of all expression and maybe big eyes or a weird nose or something. Something you can literally use in your images for expression, not to make fun of, but expression. And I think it's very wise for people to look back to uh, America's Next Top Model. I, I believe it's season one or two or three, there was somebody they called the alien with a really weird face. And from the start of everybody was going like, no, nah, she can never win. From the day one, she was my favorite. Like, look at that face. Every other picture you see, a beautiful girl, that's so freaking boring. Look at that alien faced girl. Wow, that's awesome. So I think I look in my models for something. I'm not looking for a 10, I'm looking for a 7 or 8 with absolutely expression to 11. Spinal tap. Okay, uh, Bert Jansen said, try within Temptation. Sharon, yes, I would love to shoot Temptation. I love that music. Nightwish fan, so Temptation fits a little bit into that uh, part. Okay, um, oops. <laughs> Besides photography, do I have other hobbies? Um, yeah, I told you guys you can ask anything. Yes, playing guitar, recording music, uh, comics, as you can see behind me. I'm a huge Batman fan. Um, I love easy comics, the really older comics from the 50s. Very, um, how do you call it, morally um, right. So in other words, somebody does something really bad, earns a lot of money, but then they die terribly. Yeah, I love that, <laughs> those kinds of stories. I love mountain biking. I During COVID, we bought an electric mountain bike. Hey, I'm a big guy and I'm not one to slow down. So I bought an electric one. Most of the time I pedal in eco, but sometimes when it gets really technical, you can use that boost mode. And man, I have fun in the, war, in the woods with my mountain bike. So that's absolutely awesome. And other hobbies. I just love my dog. I love my wife and um, movies. I love watching movies. We have a nice home theater. So I think between working with photography, which is without a doubt my number one hobby, we have music, comics, and of course movies and my family, which sounds really lame, but hey, it is. Calibrations, yes. And that was all, calibrations. Okay, calibrations. Now, why is that important? One of the things that people don't realize is that we all see colors totally differently. So my red is totally different from your red. It could be that my red looks a little bit more blue than your red. It could actually be that my red is blue for you and your blue is my red. But we all experience the Teratools logo as being orange. Unless, of course, you have an eye dev deviation like color blindness, then you could see this differently. But m let, let's say 90%, 99% of the people will say this is orange. This is gray, and let's see if I point towards this. We all know this is green, right? And that's because we give that the label. Now, when we look at colors, we have red, green, and blue. Those are the primary colors, red, green, and blue. Our eyes see red, green, and blue. Our monitors transmit red, green, and blue. And when you go into paintings, by the way, there is another primary colors. But the normal primary colors are red, green, and blue. Connected to red, green and blue is the black body curve. This is what Kelvin invented and it had the Kelvin scale going from red, really hot, 2800 degrees Kelvin, all the way to white, very, 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 very hot 
And in the middle there was this point called D65, 6500 degrees Kelvin, where we calibrate on. That's our white point. Now when we draw lines through the white point from our primary colors, we hit the secondary colors, cyan, magenta and yellow. So that means that the whole triangle has to be in balance. So everything is calculated that that whole triangle is in balance. If that triangle is in balance and you hit the certain limits, we call that a color space. Most famous sRGB, Adobe RGB and of course Profoto RGB. By the way, isn't it cool that there's a whole color space named after your company? That's awesome, right? I don't see Frank Dorof color space, <laughs> which would be really messed up probably. But besides that. So that color space is defined. In other words, you know exactly how it's supposed to be. Now all displays, monitors, laptops, even your printer, even your display from your camera, the display I'm looking now from my uh, recorder, they all have different panels, they all have different color spaces. We call that the native color space of a display. Now we have to make sure that that native display shows the color space that you turn into in the HDMI or any other port correctly. Now a lot of people think, hey that's easy, you just define everything in coordinates, you send it to your display and it works. Yeah, no. The first thing is, indeed, we confine everything into a color space called sRGB. We know the coordinates for every color in sRGB. They have three coordinates, an X, U, saturation and luminance, the big Y. Yeah? So we know those coordinates, but in the file those coordinates are stuck together, right? Because that's the color space we are working in. Now, when you send it to your monitor, there's one problem. The monitor sends it to your eyes. And the eyes see it slightly differently because the monitor, well, has its own native color space. So we have to make sure that that monitor can show you the colors right. And that's why we use color analyzer. So we use a little device, see it as a camera, we hang it in front of the monitor and the software actually sends images to that analyzer. White, black, everything in between, red, green, yellow, blue, cyan, magenta, a lot of colors in between, brown, whatever, a lot of colors. All those colors have fixed coordinates, that's why they first meter white and black, so they know the dynamic range and within the dynamic range, remember that big Y, all those coordinates should fit nicely into their spot. Easy, right? So that's what the analyzer does, it just looks at those coordinates, it sees the coordinates it gets in and it creates a little file and that's called an ICC profile or DCP profile. That profile you run for your monitor and you're done. You have a calibrated workflow. Now a lot of people go, Frank that's really difficult. No it's not. You start up the software, you take out your analyzer, you put it in front of your screen, you press two buttons and you're done. Because everything I just explained to you is to make you understand why you should calibrate, not how. Okay, so why should you calibrate when your client watches at an uncalibrated monitor? Question a million times. Simple. I just told you that we all experience colors differently, right? But this is orange. We all know that this is orange. So when you now look at your screen, this is orange, right? Yes, it's orange. Okay, now look at another screen. Is the orange exactly the same? No, because you're probably looking at different screens and probably they're not calibrated. Or maybe one is and the other isn't. Even when I now look at my screen there, my screen there, my screen there, they're all different. Weird, right? Not completely. I am used to that screen, that's a calibrated screen and I'm used to it. Everything I see on that screen, on that screen, it's not important, it's that screen. Now when somebody sends me something that is retouched on a non-calibrated monitor, the first things that can go wrong is not the colors, it's actually the black detail and the white detail. I see a lot of people that send me in images where I still see power cables. And I tell them like, hey I see a power cable. No, no, that's black. I see a power cable, dude. No, no, it's totally black. Trust me, I see the power cable. They up with the brightness a little bit. Oh my god, I see a power cable. That will be solved when you calibrate because you have a fixed black and white point. The other thing is actually colors. If you look at a monitor and you are used to seeing 10% too much blue, every image that comes in will have 10% too much blue for your eyes. So if everybody uses calibrated settings, you don't see any difference, all the images look right. But if somebody doesn't calibrate, that image will still jump out as, hey, that looks weird. So even when you calibrate your monitor, 
and your client has a non-calibrated monitor, it will still look right. It will still look orange for that customer because it's used how orange looks on that monitor. So if you don't calibrate and your client sees it, this could be not orange, but it could be red, right? You get my idea? So always calibrate. It's really, really important. Okay, now uh, Bert actually asked me, do you use that ICC profiling in Photoshop? Okay, very, very easy. Every device has its own color space, right? Its own calibration. So when we shoot, we use a color checker passport from Calibrite, previously known uh, x -Rite. So we use a color checker. That's how we actually make sure that our camera sensor is calibrated. That's why we use the Calibrite software for that color checker passport. That one creates an ICC or DCP profiling. If you use Adobe software, it uses a DCP profiling. If you use Capture One, ICC. The software can do both nowadays. So that's the calibration of your camera. You will immediately see that the colors looks way better. And the most important thing, if you lower and raise the saturation, you won't see weird color shifts. It will literally go up and down really nice if you did your white balance, by the way. But that's easy, right? White balance, we all know, just press on the gray square and you're done. After that, of course, you also have a monitor. Now the monitor is calibrated by your analyzer, which is in front of it. Actually, you do the same thing, only now the color checker is inside the monitor. It's the software. And when you take uh, your photo with your camera, your camera takes the photo of the software, right? Of, of the squares. So for your monitor, you use the ICC profile for your monitor. So in my case, the BenQ. When you open up a file in Photoshop, and I think this is where the question goes, do you edit in the calibration of the monitor or do you calibrate into your color space? This is where a lot of people go wrong. You only use the ICC and DCP profiling for the devices they were created for. So when you open up a file in Photoshop, you are still editing in Adobe RGB or sRGB. But the display uses the ICC profiling from that calibration, just like your camera uses your um, color checker. And like your printer also uses that profile for the paper you're using and the ink. So never ever edit in, for example, a BenQ color profile. Always edit into a fixed color space like Adobe or sRGB. Okay, um, Piotr, uh, well, I do calibrate my monitors using an x rite I want to, however, I always feel the end result is a bit skewed towards the red. If I display a blank white page, is it a slight pink, it's you to me. Um, if you are using the i1, make sure that it's not older than two or three years and what I found out with x rite in the past, and I don't know if that's still the case, I didn't notice it on the bank use, is you need um, a pre-profile. It, it sounds a little bit weird, but do the same. This works also. Calibrate it once. If you see the reddish pink tint, calibrate it right again. So you calibrate it once, you, don't, you save it, you do the before and after, you do everything, and right after that, you don't leave the software, you immediately do another run. In the past, that really solved that red U issue. On the other hand, I don't see how much red there is in there. A lot of people are used to white that is way too blue. So in other words, every time they see white that is correct, and the official uh, white should be a little bit towards red. So pure white in a calibrated display is slightly towards red. It's, it, let me call it this, it's warm white. It's not reddish white, it's warm white. So if you see a pure white screen, it's often way too blue. Uh, same thing when you walk outside a window and you see blue light coming from the inside, that's often the TV. So much blue is in the image to make white wider. Um, so the BenQ, as th this is an, um, I think an next question. Oh, wait a minute, this is from Baird. So the BenQ SW2700 stores that ICC. With BenQ, there's another thing. BenQ has hardware calibration, just like some other brands. And I think when you buy a monitor, it's important to buy a hardware calibratable monitor. What happens when you do it in the computer? Think about this. When you open up Photoshop and you have curves and you draw everywhere, you start pulling on the curves. At one point, you will lose bit depth. Even on a 16-bit file or 32-bit files or whatever you want to use, you will lose bit depth. So you start seeing weird artifacts. Now, when you do calibration in a monitor, you can do it on several points, but you still are pushing around. So this is why it's so important to have 12 bits internal monitors or 16 bits or whatever bits they use. 
it's not only to sh display, it's also what they use for the calibration, right? Now, when you use a BenQ monitor or any serious photography monitor, those monitors will have a hardware lookup table inside the monitor. So you're not actually calibrating the video card. What you're mostly doing is correcting the video card, but the most of the calibration is done inside the monitor. That's also why at the end of Palette Master you see writing monitor. So it literally updates it to the monitor. This is also why the monitor has to be connected with USB before you do the calibration, because otherwise it just doesn't recognize the monitor and it can't store. Hardware calibration is always, always better than calibration in the computer. So when you have that option, make sure you use the software that was delivered with your monitor and do the hardware calibration. Very important, gives you way better results. Um, Okay, thank you. We'll try that. Maybe I do a compare to the white on the blue side. I do have a BenQ monitor. Yeah, try that with the white on the blue side. I, I think that if you start adding white, blue will of white will look nicer. It's the same thing when you do um, um, the wash. How do you call it? The laundry. When you put in th those tablets, they always have those blue dots. Blausel, we call it in the Netherlands. That makes it more white. So that's also happening in your monitor, but it's not correct. Okay, let me see. Um, <laughs> will I start traveling again? Uh, yeah and no. Um, yes, tomorrow we are going to Belgium. Um, we're going to do photo days, three days on the FIDEC boot. So I'm really looking forward to it. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be a lot of fun to see people again and of course in a trade show environment. On the other hand, I'm also a little bit worried. We have so many people traveling around and not taking notice to the virus anymore. And they go like, yeah, we're done with COVID. Yeah, but COVID isn't done with us yet. So this morning we heard on the radio that actually, I believe Morocco is closing the borders because there's a new variant out there and they have to do more research. And then you read the rest and you go like, but people still have six days to leave the country. You go like, yeah. You know, it worries me a lot at the moment. Because if you find something where the vaccines doesn't work anymore, we are starting at day zero again. So why not close the borders and don't let people fly? So will I travel again? I hope, I literally hope the moment it's safe, the moment you can go into an airport without a mouth mask, when you can get into a plane without a mouth mask, that's the moment I start flying again. Before that, I want to do every test they want. I, I have my vaccinations. I, I want to have booster shots. I don't care. I trust it. Blame me for it, I don't care. But I'm not going to fly as long as I have to wear a mouth mask. And that has nothing to do with that I'm against mouth masks. I still think it's not safe. Literally on the photo days you will see me wearing a mask for the very simple reason. I don't think it's safe yet. Done. So I'm not going to go into an airplane if I can do it online. So most of my work will be online or trade shows where we go in like in the Netherlands or Belgium or Germany, where we can get with our own transportation and where you have huge sites where you don't stand crammed next to each other. But I'm not going to go in a plane very soon. Trust me, never. Uh, not soon. Never, I hope, of course, but yes. Okay, personal and work. How do I combine personal and work? Uh, that's very difficult and that's why I'm happy with any week because any week is just as crazy as I am. If you are married to somebody like me, um, you have to be aware that sometimes I work almost 24 seven for seven days a week. And sometimes there is a week where I do absolutely nothing because I have to wind down and I have to <laughs> think about myself. And that's actually what any week always tells me, like stop, take off, just relax for a few days because I want to go on continuously. And she actually helps me out by not doing that. Okay. Um, oops, let me destroy that. Okay, um, hi Frank. I was wondering where you get the inspiration for the outfits that the model wear on the photo shoots. Do the models have their own selection of clothing? Do you work with clothes designers and do you hire the outfits? Um, okay, um, <laughs> let me start by this. I'm Dutch. So spending money on a photo shoot. Uh, this is a joke, by the way. A lot of Dutch people are not like me, but some are. So spending money on a photo shoot where I can't earn it back is not something I would do as a hobby. Also, not voluntarily. So what I try to do, and this is what I love about, for example, working with Nadine, is we try to get stuff on a real nice budget. So go to secondhand stores, 
Let me see how my batteries are doing. Great. Okay. Go to secondhand stores. Uh, borrow bags. Not steal. But <laughs> find something that your mother or your grandmother have in the attic. Because those uh, stuff, of those clothing or materials or whatever you find, can get really interesting for a photo shoot. And again, Nadine has done some amazing stuff. Let me, let me just go through some of that stuff so you can see what we do. And clothing wise, for example, just a red dress. Very, very simple, a beautiful dress, by the way, don't get me wrong. But it's not like groundbreaking. Um, uh, you can use big, uh, how do you call it, uh, flowers. There we go. <laughs> don't think something else. Uh, let me see. Uh, gas masks and material we actually bought online, like uh, fabric that's really wavy. Uh, they also use it in lingerie, but it's not exactly the same, but it looks like it. And you can buy it on big rolls and a gas mask in this case. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's again, not very expensive, but it works like a charm. Just go to a, to a store where they have that kind of stuff. And we use a lot of chandeliers, which you can buy for literally like five or ten euros online or on a flea market and one of the things that is really cool is Nadine actually has a vintage store so I don't really <laughs> have to look for clothing Nadine always has something but I'm not the kind of person that always relies on somebody so I will literally ask Nadine sometimes and we have a whole collection of her in our studio so which models can pick and Nadine sometimes refreshes it so we, we still have a lot of stuff here from Nadine, but I also try to get a lot of stuff for myself because I don't want to lean on somebody like, hey, I want, I also want to do something myself, right? So we normally go to flea markets like every week and just find stuff that's weird. And that's the key word, weird. I'm not going to do a photo shoot with a chair that's normal because that's not interesting. I want to do a photo shoot with a chair that's weird, that's from the 70s, or that's had a really weird color, or that's broken, or whatever. So, yeah, creativity, I think Nadine helps a lot. But stuff like this with um, uh, plastic, I don't even remember who thought of that. But a dress, this is absolutely one of her ideas. So it doesn't have to be expensive, as you can see here, but it certainly doesn't have to be designer goods. And I think that's where a lot of people go wrong. Like, you don't have to use designer goods to make it look like a designer goods, if you know what I mean. You can make a million dollar looking images by really cheap materials. And we have a whole workshop about that by Creativity and Styling, which we did last week, where we, um, last weekend, where we actually used garbage bags. And I didn't post these images online yet, so you guys are the first that's going to see them. So... She literally used garbage bags. Oh, let me switch back to my desktop. Look at this. This is garbage bags. Isn't that insane? I think so. <laughs> so, yeah, it doesn't have to cost a lot of money, but... Where do you get the ideas? That's the main problem. I, I literally were on... We're almost addicted to uh, clips by Lady Gaga. I, I, the music, okay, I like the music, but it's not really my style. But those clips, literally, if I watch one Lady Gaga clip, I get like 10 ideas. Because it's not one thing she shows, she shows so much. So, yeah, that's where we get the ideas from. And then the problem is how to translate something that costs like 10,000 euros into something that I can afford. So that's literally cheap or for free. And that's where we actually have to start using material that we already have on our attic or, for example, that we just buy on a flea market. Okay, um, the top photo tip. <laughs> the top photo tip. Okay, this is going to be fun. Um, yeah, do remember that your model doesn't see what you see through the camera. Most important thing. I hear a lot of photographers literally bitching at their models like, hey, do this, hey, do that. And... I always go like, hey, do you realize that what you're telling your model that they do wrong, they actually don't do wrong? So, for example, yeah, move your head a little bit. I can't see that second eye. That's not her problem. That's your problem. She can't, she's not psychic, right? She doesn't know what you see through the lens. So make sure that you coach your model nice. 
So that's actually why I always go like, I never say that's wrong. I always go like, hey, that's great, cool, nice. And when I'm really enthusiastic, my, my voice will go up a little bit. So I go like, yeah, nice, it sucks. Yeah, great, nah. Oh yeah, I love this one. <laughs> Absolutely not. Oh great, I love this shot. No. Wow, this is awesome. Yeah, now we're getting there. You see, so when a model knows me a little bit, she knows that when I'm getting into, into the curve, she's doing fine. And then I get more and more enthusiastic. And I also think that helps to just trigger that shoot. You know, in the past there was this expression, the first set, the first set from the first set, right? So you always shoot without film in the camera. Why? To relax the model, to loosen them up, but also for yourself. So the top photography tip, and again, create that relaxed environment. Make sure that your model is absolutely at ease with you, but make sure that you as a photographer realize that one, the model gives everything in front of your camera. Two, you are responsible for how she looks on the camera and 3C doesn't see what you see through the lens. So coach, coach, coach. And don't go left or right because her left is your right, right? So when she goes left and you mean right, you have to say go right because then she will go left because your right is her left, right? Now if you have a smart model, she knows that your left is her right. So when you say left, she will actually go right. But you of course know that her left is, you know, right. It's a joke we always do on trade shows, but it's 100% true. People know how to coach will get better results. And left and right for me is always a little bit that way, a little bit that way, tilt your head, chin down, chin up. And then without a minute, just look at my face, right? Look at my hand now and follow me. You will immediately start doing your hand like face like this. And when I do this, even when I don't explain, people will do it automatically. And that works so much better. Even when the music is blaring loud, you don't have to shout at your model. And it's always like, okay, that way, that way, that way. Perfect. Okay, um, do you have any advice for shooting a classic portrait in the Rembrandt styling using one or two RGB LED panels, newer 530 LGB LED panels as a continuous light source? Um, yeah, well, light sources really doesn't matter for me. It's light is light. I, I can do great shots with a, with a flashlight or with a candle. And you can do mediocre and terrible shots with a bronze color that costs 10,000 euros. The idea is what do you do with lighting? And this is actually where it becomes really interesting because what do you do with lighting? Let me just show you what you can do. So your question is how do you create that Rembrandt look? Well, mostly people then mean the Rembrandt triangle. Now, when you try the Rembrandt triangle, a lot of people end up with this totally flat lit image and they go like, what am I doing wrong? Because it's not 100% flat lit. Actually, the light is on the side of the model. So on the side of the monkey, that's where the light is. And you can see that, right? That's the brighter part. This is the darker part. So they end up with something like this. Then they start moving their lights around and they go like, okay, let me try something else. And then for example, they start doing stuff like this and they go like, yeah, but I don't see the Rembrandt triangle. What's the problem? Now, this is where it becomes interesting. Let me just show you one where you can see it. There you go. Okay, so this is not a perfect example, by the way, but I got this really quick. What am I doing here? I am literally lighting my model from the back. And this is what I don't see a lot on videos or in books or whatever. It's always like there is this model and there is this invisible barrier, like the neutral zone in Star Trek, where you can't pass. And all the lights, they can be really close to the model, but they never pass the neutral zone. It's like, no, you don't pass that zone. And that's a shame, because if you don't pass that zone, the whole Rembrandt triangle is meant to create light falling over your nose, so the nose is black, creating a shadow with your nose towards here a shadow and just have only a little bit of light on the eye. Triangle of light, nose, forehead, eyes, create a triangle, right? So you can never get that effect when you are not behind your model. Get it? Right. So when you want to create that effect, place your lights behind your model, move it slightly forward, let your model look a little bit there and just capture that triangle over there. It's not rocket science, but I have to be honest, it's one of the most tricky things to get right. Because even when I look at my shots, this one is really nice. But still, 
there are so many images where I'm close, but it's not there. Like for example here, it's very close, but it's still for me a little bit too open on the side. But also here, light is on the side. Always look for that dark nose part. And that dark nose part can only happen when that part doesn't get any light. So always make sure that that light is blocked by the nose. And as soon as it's blocked by the nose and you don't have it too far back, you will have automatically light on this part because it's a little bit higher than the cheek. So it's literally just figuring out where to place it. And if you get it, you can do it probably over and over. It's just a little trick. But to get it 100% right, man. <laughs> I can do it, but when you are really into a photo shoot and you let the your move around a little bit, it can be a little bit tricky. And by the way, these I I have a neck for a neck. Uh, I mean, I I love the classical portraits like this kind of stuff. But this is more butterfly lighting where we use the lighting from the top and you get this really nice uh, thing under the nose. Same here. Now shift it just slightly to the side. So this is besides Rembrandt triangle, I think one of the most used lighting setups. And you can even use it under a slight angle like here, but hey, just figure it out. Light, light can be anywhere you want, like here. And now we're just blocking light off to make sure that th the model gets a more interesting light on her face. So it's not really about creating just one triangle, it's just being flexible with your lighting. See it as water. You can just move it around and create interesting shadows and even if you are adventurous, you could try to do a real split lighting, which I try many times and most of the times I'm not happy with it. But I did like the outcome here. So this is literally just one part totally dark and then accent lighting on the sides. But somehow it, it still doesn't look right for me, that image, but I still like it. The same here with Claudia. Just a little bit of light. It's not a Rembrandt triangle. It's almost split lighting, but just a little bit of light there. So you can... You see what I mean, right? This is the Rembrandt triangle technique. It's not the Rembrandt triangle because it's open. And maybe I'm too much... Um, can you say anal about it? I don't know if that's the right expression. I heard it on TV somewhere. Maybe I'm too picky about it, but hey, I want that Rembrandt triangle to be perfect. And I only have a few shots where it actually is. Unless I tell my model to go like this. Okay, stand, move, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. A yeah, little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and then shoot. But hey, that's a post image that doesn't have any motion, that doesn't have any swoon. So I, I never take those shots. Then it's easy, of course, because you see what you're doing, right? Okay. Um, oh, online we have questions. Exhibitors will be behind class screens at photography show here in the UK, plus the number of visitors was limited. Um, yeah, you know... It's not that I'm afraid of something or I want to be behind the screen. It's the whole part of who I am is I like to shake hands with somebody or give somebody a hug and you can't do it now. And I always feel a little bit like, hey, it's like I, I'm not interested in people. And it's all in my mind, of course. But and I still think that the people this is the thing what worries me a little bit. Like, if they're all like me, they understand that I don't shake hands. But there's still a few people out there, and I've encountered them over the last few weeks, that just act like there's nothing going on anymore. So this, they come up at you and go like, hey, Frank, how are you? And I go like, hey, <laughs> can we keep a little bit of distance? No, we're done with Corona. And you have your vaccination, so you're fine. And <laughs> don't. Just don't. And that's a little bit what worries me going to a trade show, that people will... If everything goes normal, I will be fine and I don't worry about it. If you keep your distance and you wear a mask when you can't, you will be fine. But as soon as you start going into that personal space, I think for me, for the next year or so, just don't hug me. Just say hi and I'm fine, you know? Yeah. Okay, Bert says, what brand do you prefer to start with strokes? I want to invest for experimenting with it. At the moment, I still use small strokes. Okay, this is a very dangerous one. Let me take a zip. I'm going to give you two answers, and those two answers are 100% true, and also 100% my own experience, by the way. Okay, now, when you look at pure, my real advice, there are three brands that I absolutely love, and three brands that I think are worth your investment, and are absolutely worth what they charge. 
First off, Hensel, what I'm shooting with myself. Great lineup of strobes. Every single strobe just works fine. They have a great range in f-stops, which is important. I'm going to tell you that later. They have great modifiers, really, really good quality modifiers. They have a great mount and they have a great lineup also for outside. Second brand, without any doubt, Ellingrom. I've shot with Ellingrom for so many years and they're a great company. I still consider them close personal friends. I switched to Hensel for not reasons in quality, but pure different reasons that are not important for you guys. But there's nothing between Ellingrom and me that's wrong. The opposite, actually. But the third brand is, of course, also important. I'm going to leave you a little bit in excitement for that one. So Hensel and Ellingrom, those brands I have personal experience with. And I can tell you, both brands, if you invest your money in, you get great devices for a really good price. You get great modifiers. The Hensel modifiers are a bit more sturdy than the Ellingroms. The Hensel strobes are a bit more sturdy than the uh, Ellingroms, and they are a little bit faster. ELCs are great and up to par with Hensel without any doubt, but are also in the same price class. And the modifiers again for the Hensels are just a little bit more sturdier, especially when you do stuff like us. I think that in the end will earn you your money back. Not that Ellingrom is bad, but it's just the, the, the stitchings are just a little bit less. But hey, that's minor, minor details. Both brands are for me number one. The third brand I have mixed feelings about is Profoto. I absolutely love Profoto. I would love to shoot with them. And sometimes when we are on uh, stages where there aren't any uh, Ellingroms or uh, Hensels, I, I shoot with Profoto actually quite a lot in uh, abroad. They always are super reliable. They are incredibly nice in modifiers. They have that nice zoom option. However, price, quality, if you compare it to Hensel and Ellingrom, I think Hensel and Ellingrom give you way more bang for your buck than Profoto does. But Profoto is very, very on the edge of technology. And it's just th those three brands are just absolutely awesome. I chose Hensel for the very simple reason. It just clicked all the boxes for me. So great modifiers, great lineup, super, super fast freezing motion techniques. Uh, they have that free mask option and it just works. And that's for me important. It has to work and all three brands do. But in the end, that drove me to Hensel. That's my real answer, right? Why those three brands? Very simple. You choose one of those brands. And I personally would go for Hensel or Ellingrom, one of those two. And personally, of course, Hensel, right? You choose that brand and you start with the cheapest strokes they have. So, for relatively less money, you get into a brand that has more expensive strobes. And this part is really important. When I started out, I started out with Jim Bay. There's nothing wrong with Jim Bay, but I invested a lot of money in modifiers. The strobes, that was one time, three strobes, that's it. Then the modifiers, that really added up. And I found out that their beauty dish was terrible. Their strip lights were terrible. Their soft boxes were terrible. Everything was not up to par, but you buy it and you start using it and then you start to find out like, hey, my image is, that doesn't look like the way that I want it. And you, you start trying Hensel or Ellingrom and you go like, wow, this is what I want. This is weird. No, it's not. It's the modifiers. Now, luckily, Jim Bay has a balance mount. So you can still convert those, convert, uh, those modifiers to other brands. But it is not 100% fixed. So it's still a little bit like an in-between solution. And in the end, it costs you money. So... My second answer is you can also get cheaper brands like, for example, Jim Bay, Falcon Eyes, Hodox is a really nice lineup. Personally, I, I, however, feel that when you get better with photography, you will not want to shoot with those brands. And very quickly, you have four or five thousand euros invested in, for example, Godox, and you get a shitload of stuff for that money. But then when you find out that that freezing motion isn't all that it's advertised, that the color stability is totally off the charts sometimes, and sometimes it's great. That the triggers, they work, sometimes not. And I'm not going to say that there's Godox, but that can happen with Falcon Eyes, that can happen with Jim Bay. It's just some of the things that you can encounter with cheaper brands. Hey, that's where the price difference is. At that point, 
you lose actually all that money because second hand you can sell it but you lose a lot of money compared to for example a Profoto, Hansel or an Ingram stroke that you sell second hand. So if you are a hobbyist and you know that you're never going to do anything with photography but you just want to shoot some models. You just love shooting models but you have a great job and it's just like somebody else collects whiskey, you just love shooting models. Go for the cheaper brands, go for Falcon Eyes, go for Hollux, go for Jim Bay or whatever. If you have a lot of money, don't. But if you are the kind of person that go like, hey, I really love photography. And at this point, I don't know what I want to do, but I want to do something with strobes. I want to do something with people. I want to do this. Then please invest in a system where you can grow. Now, why Hansel, Ellingrom and Profoto? I think when you look at pricing, all two brands, Hansel and Ellingrom, are very, very reasonably priced, almost in the same category. When you look at Profoto, it's slightly above, but it's still reasonable if you, if you have that money to spend. When you go up, you go into Bron Color, for example, which is awesome. I worked a few times with Bron. It's amazing gear. But when you look at what it costs, I can almost do my whole studio for one setup with Bron. So, yeah. So, in all honesty, when you start out with photography, first ask yourself the question, is this something I, for the rest of my life, want to do as a hobby? Go for cheap strokes, but also know what you pay for. And don't expect anything to hold up when it's windy or when something falls down. It will break. If you think like maybe in the future I want to do something with photography, get the cheapest strobes from Hensel or Ellingrom. Those two have very cool strobes like the D-Light from Ellingrom and the Certo from Hensel. They, they are both about the same price. But you get so much more than you get from a Jimbe or a Falcon Eyes. And you get the real modifiers. So you can get a really cool softbox from Hensel. You get really cool uh, strip lights. You get everything nice. It costs you money, but it will fit on those strobe heads. And then when you are ready to freeze motion and you want to go to the experts, that's when you take the Certo off. And now you move the Certo to the back and you get your new experts in the front. And now you have a studio with five strobes. You get it? Everything is compatible with each other. Everything functions with each other. And you just have a way better system. And you just slowly grow in it instead of selling everything with a loss and not reusing it in the studio. And of course you can reuse Jim Bay also with uh, Hansel, but hey, it's not 100% perfect, especially with color, uh, color stability. Okay, <laughs> Paul says, thanks Frank, I'll keep practicing. That's the way, the moment you stop practicing. Oh, and I want to give you one tip about practicing, by the way, and about making mistakes. A lot of people use the term fail. And you can't get me more angry by saying fail. You can never fail. You fail when you stop. It's not my wisdom, it's from Steve Vai, a guitarist I look up very, very much. I look up to very much, sorry. And it, it became about playing guitar and shredding, so playing really fast and knowing all the theory. And he, he just said something really simple. He said, all those photographers that are disappointments because they, are, they have failed into do something fast. He says, you never fail if you just keep trying. So with photography, the same thing. With creativity, the same thing. Never stop trying because the moment you say, I'm not going to do this, that's the moment you failed. But the moment you go like, hey, this time it didn't work and next time it will, that's the learning process. And you can never fail in the learning process, right? The moment you do your exam, that's when you don't do anything after it. You fail or you win. Photography isn't an exam, so we can never fail. Hey, that saves a lot of baggage on your shoulders, right? Okay, uh, the top photo tip. <laughs> top photo tip. Yeah, look through the viewfinder. Um, this is one of the jokes I sometimes tell during uh, our street and travel photography uh, course. And this is actually 100% the truth. Did it ever happen to you guys that you were on a beautiful location? You look out and you go like, wow. You take a picture and you go like, wow, this was it. You go into your car or your RV or whatever. And then you come back in the hotel and you can't wait to show your images to your wife. And you go like, or oh, partner. And you go like, wow, this is so amazing. Look at this. And you start looking for that image and you go like, where the hell is that image? I can't find that image anymore. What's going on? Where is it? And then you find one mediocre image where you totally don't see what you saw there. And you realize like, oh yeah, I took one shot. That's it. Hmm, that's a disappointment. Look through the viewfinder. 
we are often, including myself and everybody, totally blown away by what we see with our real eyes. So we look and we're like, oh, wow, this is amazing. Look at that. Look at the waterfall. And what we forget is that we have zooming eyes. So that means that I can literally zoom in very quickly to the monitor, but also can zoom out and see everything else. The camera doesn't. The camera only has one viewpoint. So that means a while ago we were in Norway and one of our friends took us up all the way to the mountain. I kid you not. This is one, there's not a lot of stuff that I want to do before the end of my life. This is one of the things that I have to do before. This was the most breathtaking experience I had in my life. We literally went all the way up the mountain and every time when we said, oh, we can't go any higher, they, he was going like, yeah, one more part, one more part. And we actually saw all the way on the top, we saw this little, little plateau and we were just going like, we're never going to make that because there's so much moss and so much wet stones. But hey, those guys know exactly what to do and I'm lucky because he told me some stuff where to stand, which I would have chosen the other way and probably broke my leg or worse. Long story short, after two hours, we ended up on the top of that little plateau. And a week, me and him, three of us, and the whole plateau was filled up. Now imagine this, you're on a mountaintop. You see a glacier straight in front of you and you turn around and the only freaking thing you see is mountains, Gletsjers, lakes, small roads, nothing else. It's breathtaking, literally, because you're all the way up high and hey, we live under the sea level, so for us it was breathtaking. Then he opens up a little box of chocolate, mountain chocolate, and he reads the lines for the mountaineers. You get the story? You can never capture that in an image. You can try, I tried. So I was on top of the mountain and the only thing I saw was literally closer to heaven you couldn't get. It was amazing. I grabbed my camera, I looked through the viewfinder and I immediately knew this is not going to happen. This is never going to happen. I still took some shots. In the end, I can't even see how high up we are for the very simple reason your camera doesn't show that whole depth. I tried it with a wide angle, I tried it with a 24, I tried it with a 70. The images just don't do justice to it. But when we were down, it doesn't look that interesting, but I took some shots on the way up, which for me didn't look interesting. Those images show the height. Those images show the materials we were walking on. Those images show the character of our trip. So yeah, top photo tip. Think about the photo, not about the experience, because the experience can never be captured on a photo, but the photo can give you a great experience. Two slightly different things. Roller coaster, you are frozen, right? Why do you think the roller coaster images aren't like this, but always like ah? Because that captures the right moment. If you just do it somewhere in a in a curve, it doesn't look interesting because you're just sitting like that. But when you do it in the right spot, that's where you have impact. So photo tip: shoot for the photo, not for the experience, and then it will give you hopefully the right experience. Retouching top tip. Yes, that's the final question, unless you guys, of course, in the chat have questions. Um, I am not big into retouching. I'm 100% honest with you guys. My retouching process could be the most simple retouching process you ever saw. I'm not going to show you the retouching process, but I want to show you some images just to give you an idea. Edit it on the iPad, iPad, iPad. Everything you see is edited on the iPad. And to be totally honest, it's edited without Photoshop. This is all Lightroom. Now, I have to be honest, I could do this for the very simple reason, because Lightroom now has local adjustments where I can do the skin. So they have clarity and structure and dehaze under, and of course shadows and highlights, which I use a lot for the face. So overall, a retouching tip, I think, is don't overdo it. I'm very much the kind of person that says you have to get the image in camera for 99.9%, .9%, but the 100% you add in Photoshop. Sounds weird, right? Okay, let me explain. The camera captures for me 99% of the image. So in other words, when you look at the image I just saw, uh, showed you, this image, it already had that same uh, that same lighting. It already had that backdrop. It already had that posing. Oh, sorry. 
wrong button. <laughs> Can happen, right? It's a live broadcast. Okay, let me go back. The only thing I change in Photoshop, and that's the thing that has a huge impact, is the coloring. Now, let me go back again, sorry. And just go through some of the images. And let me just start. So, uh, and just let, let me do something really weird. Okay, let's go. One, two, boom. And stop. Okay. Look at all these images. They all have totally different colors. Or black and white. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, there we go again. They all have different colors. What I try to do is by every photo shoot I do, I try to find the correct color scheme in Lightroom. So when I go into Lightroom, for example, let me go into Lightroom because I also have one a review image I still have to do. So let me go here and go for edit. So Let's say that this is the image that comes out of the camera, right? And I'm going to do the uh, review right away. So let me just show you my thought process about that and about retouching. OK, so this is one of the images that was sent in for review for today. Um, now, first of all, I think that it is a really busy backdrop. And I don't think the model stands out a lot in this case. So what I would do is I would literally just... Um, but I would use strokes, so I would get it 99% right in camera, right? So now I have to do it in Lightroom. So I will do it really rough. You guys can do it way better if you take your time. So let's go into uh, let's go into local adjustments. Okay, let's do the whole image with local adjustments. Let's take the eraser, make it really. Small and again, I'm doing it really rough. You guys have to do it way nicer. Okay, I would have used strokes to make the backdrop darker and make the model jump out just a little bit more. There we go. Okay, so that would be part one. So let's say this is the image that jumps straight out of my camera because I'm using strokes and that makes sure that my model doesn't look like she's beamed up or glued in. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at my composition. Now, in this case, she's really centered in the frame. That's something that I personally wouldn't do. I want my image to breathe a little bit. So again, in this image, I have to do it in Lightroom. I would do it in camera. I would do, for example, this. Okay, so now the attention is a little bit more drawn to my model and to the negative space, which I would love if they call it positive space because they really add something to the image. Now the only thing I have to do is just look at my image and go like, okay, so what do I want to do? What do I want to show my viewers? What kind of idea? Well, when I look at the image, I go like, okay, it's full, but I still see green. So yeah, let's change that a little bit. And this is the part where I meant like, the image is 99% there, but I'm going to do 100% changes in Lightroom. And I don't mean add 1% to make it 100. No, literally, I'm going to create a totally different look in Lightroom compared to the original. The original doesn't look that interesting. In this case, it did because there was some retouching done. You, you get my drift, right? We all know how RAW files look. They are flat. They don't have any detail. And we have to bring that in by using contrast and, of course, by using curves. And that's actually what the photographer sent me. So I'm not saying that his image looks flat. I'm just saying a raw file looks flat. So now we have to start working. So this photographer already did all the work. The only thing I changed was the backdrop. So let's say that we start here. Now what I'm going to do is I want to make sure that my image has a little bit more of that fall feeling. So I'll go into color grading. And I would literally go like, okay, shadows, maybe a little bit warmer. There we go. Let's add a little bit to the mid-tones that I still see my skin tone. There we go. Highlights also a little bit towards. There we go. And global. Just cool it down a little bit. Okay, before and after. Let me do that very quickly. Should be very subtle in color. As you can see, it just gives it a little bit more 
of a darker yellowish look. So that's what I do in Lightroom and Photoshop. I just tint my images and that creates something completely different. Now let me see if I have, that's the cool thing. We did the photo shoot with Nadine, of course. There we go. So let's go to those final images and let's just show you how they look without retouching. So this is the origin, uh, this is the retouched version of course in Lightroom, just hold. And this is the non-retouch version. Now you might say, wow Frank, that's a huge difference. But it didn't change anything to the image and it's all in Lightroom. The thing is, I think I know where I change my stuff and that's mostly in color. As you can see here when we go to color mix, see that I literally just bumped up the reds. So when I take that down, the image becomes a lot less interesting. Do you see that? Every other color, the only thing I lowered is green. Probably because that was somewhere in the dress in a reflection. So in essence, th th only this. Okay, now let's go to color mix of color grading. Let's see what we did there. Nothing really extreme. Very, very slight changes. And when we go to light, that's a big change. I actually bumped up the shadows and the contrast a lot here, but that's for this look. Normally I never bump the shadows and contrast that high, but for this, this looks I want it. And as you can see here, it, the image is there. So for retouching, I think a lot of people try to shoot something and then think they can fix it in Photoshop. And in the end, that will always be a disappointment because some things like mood and atmosphere, you, you can't simply add in Photoshop. It's, not natural, it doesn't look right. But still, as you can see, the, the difference between unretouched and retouched is huge. But what I do is very, very little. And I think that's the thing that you have to realize. If you have your raw files and you have to push on them so very, very hard to create something that looks interesting, start thinking about maybe before I press the shutter, let's fix at least the composition. And when I'm outside, let's make sure that I can balance my color. So make the model pump out a little bit more from the backdrop and the rest. And the rest will come by itself in Lightroom, I wanted to say. Okay, let's go back to that review image because I do want to give a review, of course. So let's reset everything back. Um, let me go. Reset all. Okay, let me switch over to my iPad. Okay, so this image was sent in for review. The first thing I want to do is I want to make clear that what I did before is still valid. I would have liked my model to jump out just a little bit more. So let's not do it the way I did before. Let's make it a little bit more simpler. Also the composition still stands. So let's do that. So let's make the composition I did before. There we go. Okay, let's make sure that the model jumps out just a little bit more and without doing anything uh, yeah, weird. Uh, so let's go for effects, let's go for vignetting, let's change the midpoint just a little bit, the roundness, there we go, model already jumps out a little bit more, make it a little bit more feathered maybe, there we go, this is okay. Um, now maybe the face and we still don't have layers in Lightroom on the iPad, so just very quickly just add a little bit light back on the face. There we go. Okay. And so I think now the model already, already jumps out without doing a lot of selections. And after that, I would literally again only change something in the colors. So let's now use color mix because we already did color grading. I would probably change the value for yellows and greens just slightly towards red. Give it a little bit more of a fall feeling. Uh, there's hardly any blues. Let me see. No. And skin tones are a little bit towards yellow, I think. So let me bump the saturation. Yes. Okay. So let's see. Now I'm focusing on the face and just adding saturation until I don't like it anymore. And make sure that the halos look nice. This is terrible. This is over the top, somewhere in between where they just blend in together. This is something that I, in the past, I forgot. And then I saw a highlight somewhere in the in the back and I was really ugly and I was going like, oh, I have to watch that in the next time. Let me show you what I mean. 
If I go here, this looks nice, but if you change the luminance just a little bit too far, look, do you see those really nasty things? And this is something that you might miss, so make sure you zoom in and make sure that you are doing it right. Okay. Now, of course, I would finish it up with curves. Nowadays, we do it actually more with um, that color grading because that works way better, but I can still do it with curves. Add a little bit of red to the shadows, take a little bit out in the highlights, go for blue, add a little bit of, of take it away, let me see. No, just add a little bit. There we go. Don't, don't want to search. I already know what I'm looking for. And there we go. Before, after, before, after. So now for me, the model just jumps a little bit more out. And when I look at the original image, for me, so let me just, so the crop, of course, uh, there we go. For me, this just, it's a beautiful image, but, and everything before but, people always say doesn't make any sense. So in this case, it's a beautiful image, but make sure that you watch composition and that the model jumps out. Now, in the past, a lot of people always said, like, watch out that there's nothing growing out of their heads, like a lantern pole or some, or, or a tree. In this case, you don't have anything growing out of her head, so that's not a problem. But the backdrop is really competing with the model. And because the model is the same luminance or even darker than the backdrop, like when you look here, the model is actually darker than the backdrop, the backdrop will win. So the model becomes more like, hey, there's something underexposed in this beautiful landscape. You know what I mean, right? And it should be, hey, there's a beautiful model in this beautiful landscape. So make sure that you point your attention towards the model. How can you solve this? She's now standing mostly in a shadow area. Maybe put her into the bright sunlight. She is already wearing sunglasses, so that's great for sunlight in the eyes. You're not going to see the raccoon eyes. Just place her in the bright sun and let's see what happens. I think you might be surprised because then the backdrop might be a little bit darker. And if you still want more light and you want softer, it's a very simple trick. Just use the fusion material between the sun and your model. And you get it a little bit softer, but the backdrop will also get a little bit higher, of course, again in uh, output because you are lowering the light on your model. But anyway, long story short, I love it, but the model should jump just a little bit more out. Okay, I think that was it for today, unless there are any more questions. Let me scroll very quickly to the chat that I didn't miss anything. Nope, looks great. Okay, so that's it for today. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. And we're going to do these episodes a little bit more often because I really enjoy doing this one. So keep sending in your questions or your images to me. And then for the next digital classroom, uh, we maybe try to incorporate them in between when the model changes sets that we incorporate them into the commercials. Okay, thank you very much for watching guys and thanks again to uh, of course BenQ and Rogue for sponsoring our digital classroom and of course Calibrite for sponsoring Behind the Closed Doors. Did you see the last episode of Behind the Closed Doors? We actually worked with Nadine in creativity and styling and I think the video turned out really nice. What I try to do with Behind the Closed Doors is not only show you the workshops, but also give you in-between tips. So all the sets I discuss, so you see the sets, I discuss the sets, I give you tips and we show you the end results. It's almost like a tutorial. Now, of course, I want to make a little bit of a commercial for myself because we also have to earn money. Make sure that you check out our videos part. So go here and if you like what we're doing, Make sure you buy one of our videos. You really support our work and the videos are absolutely, I think, amazing compared to what we do online. Online is great, but the videos go way more in depth. Okay, for that, I want to sign off and I want to thank you so very much for watching. And if you're in Belgium, make sure you check us out on the FIDEC booth. We are doing live photo shoots four times a day and we are printing the images really big and signing them and giving them away to you guys. So make sure you check us out on photo days. Just don't hug me or in a week. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm not kidding. Hmm. Anyway, thank you so very much for watching, guys, and 